All right, are we ready? Okay, well, uh, I'm Todd Kulik. I think I met most of you. Uh, Gabe is sitting right here in the front row. He's gonna help me with demos and mingle with the crowd in a little bit. Um, I guess first off, I just wanna say it's great to be back here and see you guys again one year later. I'm really excited that this year we're coming to talk and tell you about what we did. Last year we were coming to learn about Hex. Uh, now we have a year of Hex under our belt. Um, I wanna talk to you about what we've been up to. Um, we are on the verge of shipping a million lines of Hex to over a million boxes, which I'm personally pretty darn excited about. Um, it's been a couple year journey for us and I'll share a little bit of that with you. Um, I also want to say thanks to Silex and the guys over here from CIFACOM. Super cool to, to take care of us. So um, what I'm going to talk about today, I'll tell you guys a little bit about TiVo. I don't know uh, people here from all over the world. We don't sell our product everywhere in the world, but we are an international company. Um, and so I suspect many of you don't know what our products are or what they do. So I'll spend a little bit of time on that. And uh, then I'll spend most of the presentation talking about TiVo and Hex, how we are uh, using Hex, why we decided to use Hex, how we decided to use Hex. And then uh, finally at the end, kind of like Elliot, I'll ask Nicola for some things that he's already promised he'll <laughs> fix. Actually, he said he wanted to do them in his talk, so I, I enjoyed your talk quite a lot. I just sat smiling. Unlike Elliot, I didn't change my deck. So I just ask your patience when you see these. I'm not trying to beat you up or something. I have, I have faith. So uh, TiVo as a company, TiVo was founded about 15 years ago. Um, the original founders are both uh, ex-Silicon Graphics employees, which is how I personally got hooked up with TiVo. I used to work at Silicon Graphics and um, many Silicon Graphics employees uh, went to TiVo in the early days. Um, Silicon Graphics is quite a bit bigger than TiVo has ever been, but there was actually a point in our history at TiVo, we would have uh, lunch every Thursday, the entire company, we were still pretty small, 40 or 50 people, and each week they would announce all the new people who had joined, it was normally one, two, three people, and they would say where they had come from. And if they were not from Silicon Graphics, everyone cheered, which was good, because we were hiring a little too, too many of those people. Um, we needed a little uh, variety, mix it up. Uh, we are headquartered in Silicon Valley, but we have software developers around the world. Um, we have one sitting over there. This is a little work with us. Um, and we currently have over 4 million active subscribers. We've probably shipped over 10 million devices into people's homes around the world. So that's great. That's a little about the company. Um, here's where we ship products. We work with a lot of uh, cable and video providers, satellite, cable, and otherwise in the United States. We work with uh, three uh, video providers in Europe. They're shown here. So if you live in the UK, uh, you can get our product from Virgin Media. If you live in Spain, uh, Ono distributes our smart TV products. And in Sweden, Comhem is our partner. So what, what products do we make? We'll show you a demo in a little bit, but our, we're most sort of famously known for our digital video recorder. Um, some of you may have a DVR or something in your home. I know a lot of you guys stream video and you're all very high tech and advanced, so you probably built your own video player on a PC out of hex. But my mom doesn't have that option, so she, for example, would be a good customer for our product. Um, she'll have hex soon, though. Um, we, so our most popular product, or our most well-known product, is our uh, digital video recorder product. Um, basically, you hook video input from some cable or satellite device up to it, and it can record it on a hard drive and play it back. Our current products can record up to six things at once. So they have six hardware tuners in them, and they can record 1,000 plus hours of HD video. Um, they also integrate with third-party streaming video services you're probably familiar with, uh, Netflix, YouTube, uh, Netflix is just beginning to be distributed in Europe, so I'm not sure, I know it's like some of these uh, over-the-top services have different names here in Europe, but uh, we, so we work with a lot of those guys. We also work with the actual video provider companies that have their own video on-demand catalogs. Um, another part of our product line is uh, second room devices. So if you have our DVR in your living room, 
you can take a smaller device and put it in your bedroom, and that'll allow you to actually watch all of your shows in the second room the same way you can in your first room. And so those devices network together and they move the video around. Um, we also have mobile applications. Gabe will show some demos and mingle with those in a bit. Um, the mobile applications can be used both to control your DVR device like a remote control from inside your house if you want. Maybe you want to look up additional information about the show that you're currently watching on the TV, so sort of as a second screen device. They can also be used, uh, you can stream content to the mobile devices, so you can actually watch your video on the mobile device. If you want to go out in the backyard, you can actually, if you're out of your home, you can stream them there as well. You can watch it while you're bored in the airport if you have a sufficient connection. And then uh, finally, we also uh, have online video web portals with some of our customers as well. So you can stream video straight to your browser, the same things you could watch in your house or on your mobile device. So here's a little picture that describes sort of the ecosystem of our devices. I just spoke about the DVR there you see at the top of the home. Uh, Mini and Stream are these satellite devices in your home that uh, help watch video in other places. We are currently working on the other bits down at the bottom, so that's sort of future. Those aren't real products we have today, but they're products that we're considering and are enabled by the fact that we're now using Hex. Uh, and then finally, outside your home, you can actually watch content and schedule recordings if you forgot to set something up and left your house. So enough about that. That's what we do. Uh, why are we interested in Hex? So I'm gonna jump back a, a couple years. So we had, uh, we had a particular problem. Our devices are partially built on top of Flash, and Flash was uh, giving us some consternation. First of all, Flash was probably going away, and since we build uh, devices that are based on embedded MIPS processors or ARM or something, we were really relying on Adobe to provide support and make the flash runtime run effectively on those devices. And the idea of having to bring that support in-house was a bit daunting. So we didn't want to become the Adobe Flash Player developer for these devices. So that alone was, was you know, the, the fact that the end of flash in that sense, or support for flash, at least for us, was looming was a, a big issue. Um, additionally, ever since we started using flash on embedded devices, we never really had performance like we would have liked. And I think our customers were pretty clear to us that Flash was not fast enough on those devices. So we were really looking for a way, as we moved away from Flash, to find a new technology that was going to give us more performance. And finally, we, we really knew that we were intending to be on more and more devices, just not our own built embedded devices, but devices made by other manufacturers, connected TVs, et cetera, et cetera. So, we uh, did quite a bit of research to, to look at what our options were for transition, and we uh, asked ourselves the question, when we found Hex, could Hex be uh, the solution to our problem? So, we are, are I, I think some of you, are, a lot of you have told me that you're very interested in how we, as a company, made our decision to switch to Hex. So, Prezi told us a little bit about, you know, how, how, how they went through this process. I'll tell you a bit about how we went through the process, and I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, initially, we decided we had to evaluate the technology. It was very, very interesting to us from the perspective of we already had a large code base based on AS3, and obviously coming to Hex, there are easy ways to do that from AS3. Um, additionally, our application is uh, built on top of the Flash API. So the idea that on top of Hex, we had OpenFL and NME to rely on was also uh, very promising. But before we could really switch, we asked ourselves a bunch of questions. I, I won't read through all these, but we want to know things about how the languages and, and uh, the language and technology worked in a basic way. We evaluated it technically. We evaluated the development environment. We had a long bullet list of questions. So I know we've discussed IDE a little. We actually had a, a, a three-page list of details about the IDE. Like, can you refactor a method down? Can you hoist a parameter out of a function to a member variable? I mean, at some quite high level of granularity, we had engineers go off and, and analyze the IDs. Um, so uh, we decided for our evaluation, what we would do is that we would create a prototype. 
we knew about AS3 to hex, and we knew that we could probably take our AS3 code and at least somewhat programmatically convert it to hex and see how it would work. Now, as I mentioned uh, on the prior slide, we, you saw the, the lines of code numbers up there probably. We, it, we had nearly a million lines of code when you count the tests. We were not going to convert all of that, but we needed to convert enough of it to answer some basic questions. How did the conversion tool work? Like exactly how much human checking and modification was gonna be required after we did the conversion? Um, we also wanted to compare the result. We wanted to know, was it gonna be even more performant than the flash runtime had been? Because the flash we had on MIPS had JIT. So there was some argument at least that it was running near native performance. We also wanted to know how much memory it was gonna use when it was running our application. Um, how big was the, the final executable gonna be? Because we're very constrained in the flash RAM space that we have on these devices. So we can't, it's not like a PC where we can use as much disk as we need. Those, the flash RAM image of our uh, most advanced product is 240 megabytes on the disk. So it's relatively constrained. And the UI is only, I don't know, perhaps uh, 20 megabytes of that. So, um, and then finally we, as I mentioned before, we wanted to evaluate the development environment. So, um, about, uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, we allocated four developers. I was actually one of them and we spent three months converting the code. Um, we converted 80% of the code, but we did it in a hack and slash manner. It was not gonna be shippable, but it was gonna help us answer our questions. And we, we were able to get answers to each of these questions that we, I'd mentioned on the previous slide. So the first thing we found was that the converter was actually reasonably good. The amount of work that we had to do by hand to fix it wasn't too daunting. And what's more, we were quite confident that even if we had a lot of hand conversion work to do, if we worked a little on the converter, we could probably make it better enough that the amount of uh, hand conversion would get quite small. Um, so we felt quite confident on that front. Additionally, we were able to do some basic performance measurement and we found out that it was right out of the gate without tuning our optimization after our hack and slash stuff about 30% faster, which we were pretty excited about. Again, the, the runtime that we had for AS3 is a jitting runtime. So it is running uh, native code, but clearly uh, Hex benefited from getting to use our native compilers and having the, the fully native backend. Um, the memory consumption was reasonable, it looked good, and we had reasons to believe that actually our app would run better in a smaller amount of memory. So if the memory became constrained, for example, the app had to swap in and out or code pages thrown out of memory and had to be reloaded from the disk, we actually suspected that the hex version of our application would behave better. Um, and, uh, but, but on the flip side, we were actually a bit worried about the size of the resulting executable. It was big, but we felt like if we went to work on it, we could make it workable. Um, and finally, uh, and I mentioned this to a couple of you guys, uh, the, on the IDE front, we found things were okay, but they were not as good as what our user interface developers had when they were working in Flash and ActionScript. So we were a little concerned, but again, we were fairly confident that with some work and the help of the Hex community, we could actually make that work. So one year ago, before Richard and I came to WWX, we, the company, TiVo, had decided to switch to Hex, and we began our, our conversion. So our strategy for converting, pre pretty uh, clear probably at this point, the AS3 code turns into Hex, uh, we compile it, and we use our, we, we have our own uh, GCC cross compiler that we run on x86 that compiles to target our MIPS set top boxes. Um, we would use NME, at, at now we use NME and OpenFL, but at the time NME only, uh, to provide a flash API. But one thing we did have to do was, NME's strategy for targeting devices is basically OpenGL and these devices don't have performant OpenGL hardware. So we knew we were gonna have to work around that. We also knew that our app pretty much only draws text and images. It's a 2D UI for finding content and then watching video. So we felt fairly confident that we could, we had, we had studied Edemy quite a bit, and we felt confident that we could build our own backend or modify what was there to get uh, things to the point we need to get them to. And so we, 
uh, identified a plan to basically build a custom backend based on direct FB. So I don't know how many of you guys have used direct FB API, but it's 2D, I know, who, who. Um, but it, it actually is nice in the sense that when you buy embedded chips from the current vendors like Qualcomm and Broadcom, they generally provide uh, hardware accelerated reference implementations of direct FB. So for us, that was a good place to sort of rest the graphics uh, on the bedrock there and be fairly confident that it would be fast on any device that we wanted. So, and unlike when we did the evaluation, this time we had to convert the code for real. We, we couldn't really uh, just hack and slash through it. And in fact, the first time we did not convert the tests at all, but this code is full of tons and tons of tests. So uh, we had every intention of taking them with us. I think uh, Peter was saying early, fr earlier uh, that so making some comments about how they had decided to partially move to, to Hex. I think for us, we really liked the architecture of our application. It had lots of tests. Um, we were quite confident in it, and we knew that it was doing what we needed it to do in the market. So instead of taking partial steps, we bit the bullet and decided to convert the entire thing. So um, this is a, just a simple picture. Um, sort of laying out the, the basic building blocks for our UI. The parts that are in purple and orange, uh, look orange, yellow, um, it's a little more uh, clear on the screen here. The, the parts at the top there in, that are shown in AS3 here are the parts that I'll say are our application. Uh, the, the middle bits there in blue are sort of the interfaces that the application rests on. And then the way that we used to deploy it and well, I guess still do in the field today until soon, is based on AIR and our own custom uh, EDK that you, you see here. And this provides extra features that allow the application to do things with our device that aren't sort of flash API. So when we converted to NME and C++ and Hex, the picture changes to look something like this. So the code at the top is the same code just converted to a new language. So uh, we had quite an interesting time explaining this to the project managers and the executive team. They were pretty sure we were writing a million lines of new code and they thought it was gonna take us a long time to debug it. And we were pretty sure, while we were sure that bugs would be introduced in the, the conversion because it was a big complicated process, we didn't think it was at all fair to think of it as like writing a million new lines of code. We were taking a million lines of code we had and programmatically converting them um, and we had lots of tests on which to do that. And I think that during the process, um, our confidence was, was borne out. And I think they came to understand we maybe we weren't as crazy and risky as they, they thought we were at first. <laughs> um, or maybe we are, and just in this case, we were doing something reasonable. Um, okay, so you, again, you can see here, we've kind of replaced the flash stuff at the bottom with, with the corresponding hex technologies. I think this picture is probably no surprise uh, to anyone in this room, probably makes sense. I drew this picture for developers at TiVo because they did not understand how all the pieces fit together. So there might be some interesting thinking we could do there about how to help make sure that people coming in understand how the pieces can replace, the architecturally replace what they had built using the prior flash technologies. I think that we're actually pretty good of, at that in terms, as a community in terms of the docs. Like, Enemy is clear about what it is, and I think OpenFL as well, but there's not anything that's sort of as holistic that gives you a, a, a big picture view. Maybe, maybe our perspective on that is a little unusual because of the scope of our app, uh, I'm not sure. So finally, once we had this thing converted, and I'll, I'll talk more about exactly what that looked like in a second, but once we had it converted, we could start to think about doing this. So this is what really excited me. And, and I can draw five more pictures like this, as all of you hacksers know, but this picture in particular allows me to target a whole bunch of interesting devices, from browsers to smart TVs and connected TVs to video streamers. And I don't have to pay another team of 20 developers and give them a year to build the software. And then every time I want to release a new feature, I have to implement it on six platforms. So the real promise of this technology is that that thing up at the top that we're investing in suddenly becomes the one place where we can deliver great new features to our customers and roll them out across our product line all at once. 
And we'll show some demos of this. We don't have a product like this in the market yet, but we are absolutely in the thick of making this work and looking at productizing it in a, in a bunch of different ways. So uh, here's a quick view of the timeline for our conversion. So uh, back in 2012, uh, somewhere in the spring or summer, we started thinking we're gonna have to leave Flash and what will we do? Um, I think uh, Richard Lee, who some of you either may know from the boards or uh, may have met him last year, uh, in the summer, Richard peeled away from his work and went off as a team of one to start evaluating Hex. And uh, in the mid or late fall, we decided that we would add more people. So we're probably around here. And this is where Gabe and I and a few other developers joined Richard to start evaluating in earnest. Um, again, spring last year, we decided to switch and started the conversion. So you can see mid last year, we start to ramp up the team. It started out with four of us and the four of us who were working on it were only doing tooling and IDE. That's all we did. So for about two and a half months, we did tooling and IDE. A lot of this, frankly, was to integrate with our systems to make sure that we could build our whole product. This is, uh, the hex code is about a million lines of code. The entire DVR product is about 40 million lines of code once you count the open source that's in there and everything. So we had to make all the pieces fit together. And uh, we ramped up to a team of maybe eight that were actually converting the code. Um, and uh, we completed the conversion uh, this past winter, I would say it was in early January, something like that. And so the orange on this graph represents the number of people that we brought onto the team in terms of all the UI developers at TiVo. So at that point, we flipped the switch and the flash code was dead. The flash code was dead. Okay, that's, that's what I expected. We, we, were, we were actually pretty excited as well. Um, we, it, was, it was complicated. There was branching and timing and multiple passes of integrating and people doing development in AS3 while other people were doing development in Hex. The overlap period was two months wide, something like this. Um, but, but by early this year, we had switched. And then in fact, what happened is we uh, have ramped down the team that was doing what I would call the conversion. So the green up there represents the resources we have uh, invested in the conversion. And at this point, I would say it's just one or two people, like uh, Brian Ishko, who some of you know, he's been working on things like churn in the C++ backend, uh, code size, things like that. Okay, so that's how we converted. And Again, I, I told you the problems we had. We were stuck on Flash, we were worried about performance, and we couldn't get easily to other platforms in a sort of cost-effective way. And um, I feel fairly comfortable saying we actually have achieved all, of, all, all three of these things, which is great. I mean, it's been uh, quite a success for us. There are still bumps, and I'll talk about those, but these original goals, we met every one of them. Uh, and I guess maybe it's interesting to say, uh, on the performance front, when we did our prototype, we got about a 30% speed up. We were a little worried that somehow we might not have captured everything, that those numbers wouldn't hold up. That actually held up quite well, and I'm excited to say when we roll this stuff to the market, we'll roll it to customers who have five-year-old devices, and on the fifth year of their existence, these devices are just gonna get 30% faster for those customers one day, which is kind of cool. We're, we're kind of not telling them at first because we want to see sort of what, what people notice, you know. Our, our, our user research team is actually interested to understand what thresholds they actually detect and, you know, what it does for sales. So it's kind of interesting. So uh, I will talk a little bit about the things we ran into. I better. Okay. I want to have time to do demos and some questions if you guys have. So. Um, We've talked a bunch about IDE, I won't belabor that, but uh, some of the, these are some of the challenges uh, we had there. Uh, some of the challenges we had were due to our application's sort of unusual requirements. So our user interface runs on the device and it takes over the full screen and it has all the graphics resources, but it has to give them up when you run a third party app like Netflix or YouTube because there's only one graphics buffer on these devices and there's not like enough extra resource for you to just 
move all your graphics over to the side and let somebody use the other graphics memory. There's no other graphics memory. There's, in fact, no other memory at all. So when it's the other guy's turn, you get nothing. So we, we had to do some work to sort of handle that. Another thing that was sort of an architectural difference with our application, um, enemy really l l is sort of fundamentally designed because Flash is sort of fundamentally designed to think about the world like there's a racetrack and you're gonna do another frame and if you're doing one now and guess what's next? The next frame. And our application kind of sits not doing much. There's video on the screen moving for the customer but the app itself is kind of calm when the user's not using the remote. Now when we first converted we found actually that the app, while calm on the screen, was using quite a lot of resources, even when the user wasn't interacting with it. So for example, it didn't understand the screen hadn't changed. You don't need to redraw it. Like it would be just fine to keep displaying the same thing. So part of, part of the work we did was to fix some of these things so that performance-wise, the device would be a little nicer for the customers. Uh, the stuff at the bottom, we've actually, I think, covered in three talks, maybe, if you count this one. So I'll, I'll go right on. And I, we're going to fix them, aren't we? Maps, yeah, okay. Um, we also found some, some uh, runtime issues that uh, we had to work on. One was, we sort of very quickly found, we, we, as I mentioned, most of our de devices right now are MIPS devices, and some of them we run Big Endian, and some we run Little Endian. And we found the, uh, so, some bugs just related to bit twiddling and the Big Endian stuff. This wasn't a big deal, but, um, and is fixed now, I believe. Um, we also worked some on uh, uh, memory churn because uh, I think in our measurements we found that the, the, the application doing nothing was generating something like 10,000 objects a second and throwing them away, which was generating quite a lot of load on the GC. So we just found the most hot spot parts of that problem and, and tuned them in a little. Um, and then the code size issue is one that I think we're still working on. So we have. Our, our executable, once it's converted, uh, compiled and converted, it's a 60 megabyte executable, which is pretty big. The thing that it uh, replaces was a, I think, five megabyte Swift file. Now, this isn't completely fair because the Swift is compressed and the executable is not. And uh, if we compress the executable, it goes down to about 15 megabytes. So it's about three times bigger. Now, when you run the Swift loaded into the runtime, it jits all these uh, pages of code and it actually uses quite a bit more memory because the JIT generated pages from the Flash embedded runtime are, they're very naive. Like if you say A equals five, it generates 13 instructions and it never uses a load delay slot or a branch delay slot or anything. So the code spills across memory pretty fast. Um, so although our executable was bigger on disk, it was actually better in memory and um, in fact, currently we have to compress it. We can't put the 60 megabyte executable on the disk. So it was a bit of a challenge. How do you, like, like Linux doesn't, out of the box, I'm not aware of anything that lets you run a compressed executable. So what we actually did was we jammed the executable into a SquashFS file system and put that, then loop back mounted. But, um, so we have a, a solution for that today. It's not ideal. I'd like to bring the size down because I think there's probably a lot of things in there that don't need to be there. Uh, and then finally, there were a couple small issues. Um, we, our product is shipped around the world. It's a TV device. The customer absolutely cares what time it is. The time has to be right and it has to be local. It's like I want to know if my show is on and being off by an hour for daylight savings or in the wrong time zone is not good. So we, we added a bit of API there. Um, I know other people have actually offered patches to the date class, I think. We, we should make sure that we're all aligned. I, I, I'm not sure we implemented every language. So, um, okay. Hey, it's rebooting. So now we have to wait two minutes. Um, hopefully only two minutes. Uh, I, we, we can keep doing questions, I think. Let's rotate around. How about Danny? Ah, good question. So this was another area where the, the marketing and management guys really sort of put our feet to the fire before they signed up to do this. Um, they wanted to know, is it going to be faster? What's going to happen? Uh, we told them we thought it would be faster. Starting the application in Flash took about 30 seconds. And that was largely because when we booted up, well, 
one, when the device is booting, like it's doing right now, you can't actually watch it, but what it's doing right now is paging a ton of stuff in from quite a slow, inexpensive Flash device. So that and then jitting all the code in Flash took about 30 seconds. Uh, with Hex, that time went to about five seconds. So that was awesome. That was a pretty good win. And I, and I actually think, maybe, maybe it's 10 seconds. Uh, part of that is we are loading some resources and things that boot up. Um, another, I actually think we could make it quite a bit faster still because at boot up, the app runs all the boot routines for all the cloud. I don't know how well you know the C++ backend, but it generates these boot routines and it runs like, in the case of our code, which is large, it runs like thousands of them at boot up time. And a lot of them do nothing. A lot of them, in our case, are classes. They have no static initializers, but the methods generated. And I think maybe we should be eliminating these with DCE or something, the guys tell me. And I think we turned on DCE standard and got some gains. We turned on DCE full and the app didn't work, <laughs> which isn't surprising. We're probably not at keeping the right stuff. We just haven't had time to do that. So, so yes, should have gotten faster, did get faster. It was great. Um, Nicola. How many hex developers on my team? Uh, okay, there are a lot of ways to answer that. I would say there are at least 50 developers at my company that need to learn hex. Okay, and I would say because, because the way we work is, um, uh, I don't know if it's unusual, but we, we try to encourage our developers to work on lots of different areas of the code. Obviously, I'm not taking the guy who's writing kernel drivers and turning around and throwing him to build a UI screen the next day, but we have a tall stack, and the, the more people can stretch a little bit in range, the better off we are. The number of people who work on UI features in some form is probably 50, maybe a little more. And I would say the number of people that have actually checked out the tool chain, built the code, made a change, checked in, is probably 30 at this point. So we, we went through some training process and we continue to do that. Hey, it's TiVo guy. Okay, so now maybe we can do a demo. Okay. So, that's Hex. Yay! Oh. I guess, I guess it doesn't say hex, hex in the build string. Maybe we took that out or something. Um, so it's, it's pulling things over the network. It's having a little bit of a fun time loading all the files it needs to load, like for the poster art imagery and stuff like that across the Atlantic. Um, because this particular box thinks it lives in California. So like I say, we, we do have customers here in Europe and uh, we have different cloud services setups, the, spot, the features on this box are sort of heavily linked to the cloud, uh, a lot of them. Some of them are not. There are certain features that uh, we require have to work even when the device is disconnected. So I'll start here. This is the main uh, part of the user interface. This is where a user can see, at least on the DVR, this is where a user can see all the shows they've recorded um, or bookmarked uh, in any form. And it can be sorted in a bunch of different ways. Um, and this all will work if, if the device is disconnected. You may lose this artwork because um, we don't have all the artwork for every movie ever on the device. Um, but uh, let's see here. Uh, so I'll just walk through the UI a little. So it uh, organizes your shows into folders automatically. I, I should pick something more interesting than this to watch. How about, how about this? So, uh, and for a given show, we, we give you a whole bunch of information about the show. You can see extra details and things like that, the actors and, and all, all this stuff. Um, so again, not having to implement this for additional devices is quite a win for us. Um, you can actually see even more information about shows. You can get cast and crew information, et cetera, et cetera. Um, of course, you can watch video. So we'll see what's going on. We're apparently already watching this at some point. The first time you play video after it reboots, it takes it a second to get the pipeline going. The <laughs> I have a feeling we're going to piss off this projector. I'm not quite sure why, but um, so uh, may maybe this is because this is a data projector and not a video projector, so it's persnickety about the resolutions or something. Um, we also have areas in our UI where we show customers things that are on right now, 
so they could go find some particular show, a sport, sporting event or a movie that's actually airing at this moment that you can watch. Uh, of course, I won't be able to do that because the box is not actually hooked to a cable network here where the wire would be quite long. Um, and uh, it provides uh, very advanced features for managing your lists of shows as well. So this is showing me all the things that this box believes it's going to record going forward, you know, some number of days. Um, and this thing is uh, sortable and filterable. So you, I, I think this box has no conflicts because it has so many uh, tuners on it. It can actually record everything that uh, is scheduled. Uh, maybe I should make a season pass. So we have a, uh, a guide UI that shows all the shows by channel. You, you guys have surely all seen things like this, right? Everybody's, TVs do this and um, we just do it clever, like quite cleverly actually. And the, the, the trick to it is that it feels really simple to, to use. Um, and so, uh, I don't know, what else should I cover in this? I, this gives you some idea of what our product is. It's good. So one of the other um, things, again, like I said, that uh, switching to hex has allowed us to do is to start to target other devices. So what I'm gonna try to show here, if this thing comes in, is uh, the exact same application, except this time running on uh, Amazon's new streaming device. Um, this thing is called uh, Amazon Fire TV. It really would like to be connected to the network. So I have to give it one second here. I just plugged it into my laptop. Yeah, this was bad planning. We have lots of cables here, but I didn't realize on my little, my laptop with super small connectors, I can't plug in the HDMI and the network at the same time. They're too close to each other. Okay, there we go. So uh, as a proof of concept, we haven't shipped this yet. Um, we have uh, demonstrated this at, at one trade show. Uh, we took this exact same code that we were just looking at running on the box and we turned it into JavaScript and HTML, and then we wrapped a little Java program around it and uh, threw it up in a web view um, so that we can run it on other devices. So now, th this Amazon Fire TV is an Android device. There's really no reason we shouldn't be able to go native. We just haven't gotten that path working yet. So uh, Joshua Granick has been working with us quite closely. Uh, myself and a couple other developers uh, worked to get the HTML stuff going in the first place. And Joshua, I believe, is currently looking at trying to help get the uh, Android path going. I I'm sure it's something funny in our app that's not doing the right thing. Okay, so this is the exact same code. It may look a little different. Um, I told it to act like our Swedish uh, partner's user interface, so it's loaded different resources, and I, I think that says my TiVo recordings or something. Um, there, there are people here that can read this, right? So, uh, and this is like search and browse or something? Uh, yeah, so, uh, and, and the other interesting thing about this demo is the user interface that I showed you on the DVR was talking to the local services on the DVR. So all the recordings, they're in that box. They're on a hard drive. Um, this particular version of the same application is running configured to talk to a virtual DVR that's running in the cloud um, back in the States. So there's not actually any coaxial wire or, well, there are hard drives. I was gonna say there are no hard drives, but clearly there are hard drives, but they're in the cloud, so those aren't real hard drives. I don't even, do those even exist? I don't know. Um, but yeah, this we call that network DVR. So this is the same UI, you experience it the same way, but it's pulling all of the information from the cloud. So with our cloud services and this user interface, we can export a, an experience to customers on such a wide range of devices. We no longer have to own the entire software stack top to bottom, which for us is also a very interesting proposition. And again, it's you know, uh, being, being uh, enabled and powered by Hex. So uh, different recordings, because again, a different device. So shall we do another one? Uh, I don't know if there's anything else to say about this guy. Uh, is Amazon Fire TV for sale in Europe? Does anyone? Not yet. Okay, uh, so yeah, 
uh, sorry, missed the last bit of the demo. If you wanna, oh, there's actually one more thing. Uh, I mentioned the mobile devices. I'll actually have Gabe, Gabe can sort of wander around, but uh, the, he has the uh, mobile application installed on, this is a, an iPad, right? And this application is capable of controlling the, the DVR that we were seeing before. He can move around in the UI and schedule recordings. You could use it like a remote control. Uh, but it can also stream video. So as, as I mentioned before, he can grab, well, you can watch planes or whatever you picked. You keep picking Charlie's Angels. Right. Maybe it's a better pick. I don't know. So, so Gabe, if you yeah, if you, if you got the streaming going, if you want to show it, hand it around or anything, if people want to see it, I guess. Uh, it's Charlie's Angels. Okay, so uh, sorry, we'll uh, wrap up here. So uh, I just wanted to outline um, a little bit about what we've done along the way. I think. We uh, owe it to all of you guys doing cool stuff, uh, especially the people who are doing it for fun and passion and not for money, to make sure that we give back uh, all the changes we make. And we will do that. We'll make sure we give back uh, all, all the stuff we've been working on. Yeah. So, I want to be clear. We'll give back everything in the open source hex libs. I can't give you my UI, but I think you probably couldn't do much with that anyway. <laughs> um, we, actually, I don't know. I don't think you would want it, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, so yeah, we, we've already contributed a bunch of things back. Uh, my, my friend Yannick here worked with us and spent a lot of time. Uh, he, he, he really was the one who drove most of the improvements to AS3 to Hex, along with one, one of our developers uh, back in California, uh, Srikanth. And uh, you, you guys may have seen some of these other things. I haven't listed names for uh, our, most of our internal developers, but a lot of you guys have probably met Brian Ishko. He did uh, the, the debugger and, and a bunch of other things. I think you guys have potentially seen him on the forums and whatnot. Um, Joshua Granick has also been extremely helpful to us. Um, sorry that he couldn't get here today, but uh, Joshua, if you're watching, thank you. You're awesome. Keep up the good work. Um, we, we, we've been working, as I said, together on a bunch of things, but most recently, uh, the version of the demo that I showed on the Fire TV, that only really happens because of the new back end that Joshua built. The old one that used tons of Canvas tags, it just would never run on that class of device. So um, it's actually very exciting to me that the new backend is capable of scaling down to such small devices. And it can actually intelligently fall back to using more advanced features, using more advanced API on other devices. So we just make sure we avoid those features and it runs really well for us on, on uh, low end devices, which is very cool. So um, future things we're gonna do. Uh, we're continuing to look at HTML and JavaScript. Um, we are continuing to look at and figure out how we can use hex and share code between our mobile devices and these TV devices. It turns out the, the form factor difference, the fact that one is a 10-foot screen that you're pressing a remote at and the other one is a device you're touching, actually really influences how much code we could share. A lot of our code is about making that experience right. But there are a lot of layers under that that are very shareable. We're, we're continuing to sort of investigate in that area. Uh, I owe you guys pull requests. Um, we'll continue to work on the IDE. I expect I'll get questions about that. Um, I think uh, my friend Hugh is on notice that we'll continue to talk about HXCPP. We're trying to crunch down the, the footprint size there, as I mentioned. So um, if you contributed to any of these, wrote any of these, uh, or use any of these, please know uh, we, we really appreciate it. These are awesome. These really made it possible for us to, to build the thing we built. So these are what we use today. I know there's a ton of other cool technology every time I come here that I go back and study and, and see how we could use, but I wanted to sort of explicitly call out the stuff that we're using now. Uh, and then finally, um, a list of things we'd like to see happen. So uh, along with everyone else, uh, I think there's interest in uh, IDE. Um, we've had some discussions about partial uh, compilation, but most of these we've, we've spoken about here, this idea of calling, call out, and short lambdas. Um, in, in conclusion, uh, 
Hex has really helped us to sort of successfully improve the user experience on our devices and to sort of bend the curve on the cost of software development for our company. I think uh, we'll, as we roll this software out, I'm sort of happy to talk to all of you guys, but we have been a little on the sly about this publicly. Not, we're not trying too hard. This, of course, will go to the internet. But I think our, uh, our marketing guys think they might want to say something about this when the software rolls in the near future. So, um, but I think just the performance has been great, but the, the ability to target all the additional platforms that this technology makes possible is really uh, going to be incredibly valuable to us going forward. So uh, with that, I would take any questions. Guys are all awesome. There is okay, one huge yeah. fan awesome. here. <laughs> okay. So yeah, you're gonna ask how we made all these decisions, right? That's what the question's gonna be. No, it's gonna be IDE. Sorry, should we just do it real quick? Yeah, I'm the guy of IDE, sorry. <laughs> That's beautiful. Now let's do it. Hi. First of all, awesome. Yay, awesome. thanks. Really awesome. I think so too. It's very cool technology. Uh, about the ID. <laughs> <laughs> about the ID. Um, you already um, you said that you told us that you spent some time in tooling. Actually, we did. I think it's yeah the, the the plugin for IntelliJ. But what else in the pipeline was missing? Maven plugins. I don't what? know. Integrate Maven plugins. I'm sorry. What was missing or is missing? It was and is. I don't know. What um, so then? when we started, I, I would say the first thing was um, we couldn't build with IntelliJ. So the first thing we wanted to do, because we have large software and we have a lot of hex libs, uh, we wanted to make sure we could just load all the code into IntelliJ and build. And there were actually some challenges. The plugin a while ago had very persnickety dependencies on the exact version of like like a year and a half ago, it was a huge pain in the butt. Like the hex plugin only worked with what they call the EAP, the early access versions, and those burn out their license every like 28 days. So we have to keep like downloading a new copy of the IDE on every developer's. There was a lot of stupid stuff like this. So we were we were actually hounding IntelliJ. I mean, I'm jumping straight to we use IntelliJ, but just and people have covered lots of interesting stuff here. We use IntelliJ because we our developers work on Linux and Mac. That's kind of how we got there. I mean, I have uh, backup slides, which I didn't really belabor. I hinted earlier that we kind of spent a lot of time trying to figure stuff out. This is a, sorry, it's a little hard to read here, but this is a roll-up slide of something, that a spreadsheet that was like 200 lines long, and we did a quite a detailed analysis. Um, so we started at building. We could even build stuff. I think where we're at today is uh, integrating the debugger, which would be great. Um, and running unit tests. Those are my like top two easily. Like we gave up flex unit and the very efficient and sort of slick test running workflow that it has for AS3. And the developers were not happy when we took their toys away. So you know, I just tell them like, look, you're developers. Like we can fix this. So, like don't complain to me. Go spend the time you're complaining like fixing it. Because we because we have the plugin source now. So for a while we didn't have that. I think that's part of what happened last year as well. We, <laughs> for a while, we couldn't actually influence it. We were mostly just pushing on, uh, um, what are they called? Jet brains. Thank you. Thank you. And is there something that you already fixed in the plugin or <coughs> directly, or you just? You're going to go to a level of detail that I'm not completely aware of. Uh, I think our developers have made some changes. Do, oh. do you happen, happen to know? Shrikon changed some stuff. and. Yeah, so I, I, I think there, it's... <laughs> so, so they broke it, is what he said. So that, uh, I guess that's a change. It doesn't sound like a good one. Oh, IntelliJ broke it. Oh, well, that's less, sounds less bad for us. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know the exact details of, of everything that changed. I think our changes in there have been modest to this point, to be fair. Well, my question is, you are currently working on that plugin or not? Yes, we are. Okay. Ah, okay. Okay, cool. No, we, we, we actually do have, we do have backlog story on debugging. 
that's near the, I mean, I'm trying to hedge how I answer your question because we, we use Scrum and we have an item in a backlog and it's about two sprints away. Yeah. But to me, that means that managerially, the company is committed to do that work. The resource isn't doing it today, but over the course of the summer. Uh, along the process, the, the, the building and releasing process, is there any other pieces that is missing? Something like the build was not stable or I don't know what else? Um, uh, so we can run unit tests today at the command line, but unit test integration was missing. So we did our build in Hudson and it had the ability to sort of pick up the flex unit test reports and draw graphs and all this. Like uh, out of the gate, we, we didn't have that. But I think that's actually been repaired, if I understand correctly. And so we have our own sort of build system. We, we kind of have hinted, all hinted at this, right? Those of us who, I guess we're enterprisey or something, Peter said. I don't want to sound too enterprisey. Okay. Like that sounds bad, I don't want to be that. <laughs> I, have a I guess I am probably. But. I have a third question. You uh, converted, you transcompiled from ActionScript to Axe, uh, the 80, 85% almost of the code. Um, well, just to be clear, we, so first we did an evaluation yeah, yeah. where we converted 85% of it, and then we converted all of it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. What, what I want, we wanted to understand is, uh, was your code depending on flex? No, maybe just some of the... You, you didn't have yeah. any MXML in the code? Okay. No. Okay, ID. Oh, are we done with the ID? Go ahead. What? Sorry. Yeah. Yep. yeah, so quick answer on uh, Flash dependencies. We weren't using any uh, Flex or X, X, XML. I don't even know what it is, to tell you the truth. Um, but we do rely somewhat on the, the what was the StageCraft runtime and what NME replaces for like the render event and event dispatch system and object focus and some of those kind of things. Although they're all abstracted away, so we're not real tightly tied to that API, we could move to something else. Because yeah. we have our own widget toolkit and our own layout engine and layering system and our own sort of way to manipulate the stage. Okay. Any more? <laughs> so one question, if, if you had to start a project from scratch without like uh, having a uh, uh, former ES3 code, would you go for Axe or not? Um, for, I mean, a project, I guess I would decide based on what the project was, but I think I even mean, the, if we... The same kind of project, right, actually. So, so if we're trying to build this application, and I know that my use case is to... Uh, I mean, the short answer is yes. Like when we chose to go with AS3, we did a lot of thinking about um, how long the code base would probably live and which devices we would want to go to and, um, and how much it would cost us to build the user interface. Like it's quite a bit of engineering effort just to build it. And uh, the one thing I said when we picked AS3, I actually wasn't the guy who picked AS3, but when we picked AS3, I just said, okay, we're never rebuilding this thing again. Like this is the last time. And then Adobe said, yeah, so <laughs> not going to support next-gen hardware. I was like, oh. And then I found Hex, so that's great. But no, I think uh, in addition to being able to salvage what we thought was a, a good code base, we, Hex has so much more promise going forward because the way it can help us coalesce a bunch of platforms where we have similar requirements. Definitely for 10-foot devices. I mean, when I'm targeting a connected TV, running HTML and JavaScript, or it's in this device, or it's on that streaming Amazon Fire TV, every one of them's hooked to a TV or a projector, and I'm controlling it with a remote. In that case, yeah, I definitely want to share the code, and I don't want to build it twice or five times. So yeah, I think given all those things, we definitely we would. OK, thank you. Yeah. Uh, what kind of the um, hardware do you have inside your set-the-box? Mainly, I'm interested on CPU, clock, and RAM. 
if it's possible. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I can say this. There are teardowns on the web or something, I'm sure. But um, that, that box is, uh, runs a Broadcom uh, system on a chip architecture that has a dual core MIPS device. Mm -hmm. It has half a gig of RAM. Um, OK, Th that's enough. It's just to compare with the, a smartphone, for instance, to understand the performances if it runs smoothly or whatever. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I think uh, just one comment on that. I think uh, you know, I, d I don't actually know the DMIP spec of that box. Um, the, our, this is our current generation box. This is called the Romeo. Uh, we call it Series Six. It's our sixth generation. Our Series Five boxes were quite a bit slower. Um, they were also dual core MIPS, as it turns out, but slower processors. But the, the, the big thing is actually on these devices, that thing can pull six HD 1080p video streams from tuners, put them on the disc, pull four other HD video streams from the disc and spit them out the network port to four iPads while playing to your TV. When all that's done, your code doesn't get much like CPU or RAM bandwidth. Yeah. So I could tell you the specs of the machine, but some percentage of that, a very meaningful percentage, is eaten by sort of background features of the device. Yeah. So in that sense, it's kind of very different. Like, getting things working on the Amazon Fire TV is easy. Like, even if that device is only half as fast as our device, it's faster because it's not doing anything else when it's running my app. It's just running my app. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Thanks. And another question is, uh, the iPad application is made with X? or uh, with Objective C? Okay, so we played a little fast and loose there. We're in the process of um, moving, like I, I was saying before, to consolidate more of our code. Yeah. That, is a, that app is purely native. On Android, we have an app that's half native, half uh, hex. Yeah. So we're taking the networking layers of the code and the business logic, the part that talks to our service, detects other devices on the network, moving that to hex. So we're trying to, I think kind of similar to the Prezi guys, we're trying to take chunks of business logic and bundle them up and be able to deliver them to multiple devices. This all kind of gets back to the topic yesterday about can you look native on a mobile device or be native enough and share your UI? And there are some uh, fun and heated debates inside our company about that. So. Okay. And I was uh, very interested yesterday on the, uh, sitting on the panel to hear some of the questions and people's ideas about trying to use native iOS widgets and use native Android widgets while still using Hex. I think, personally, I think it's a really interesting idea. Um, I agree with Cow, it's hard. <laughs> like, it's complicated because you have to deal with like lists and scrolling and interactivity. I don't think the drawing side is actually that hard. I, I agree with, uh, maybe uh, Nicola was saying that yesterday. I think the interaction side is, is the hard part, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, cheers. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.